couple. Okay. How many of our like physics students? Okay, couple. Okay. So I think uh my talk today is going to be maybe very good example, like in case you are engineer engineering student but who likes to do some research related to physics. Or if you are a physics student, but you like to kind of switch over to engineering side for your job, for your master PhD degree, okay? So then I think this is going to be a perfect example because um, myself is going is an electrical engineer. I mean, I did my bachelor, master, PhD, all in electrical engineering, but I'm doing a lot of research that is also related to uh, physics and quantum. So let's see, okay? So uh, my title is from uh, Quantum Materials to Devices and Applications. So before I start, I want to ask you if you can define what is quantum material. Anyone has idea? So quantum computer, for example, is a computer that uses the effects of quantum mechanics to each of French. So when I first saw this definition, you know, I didn't really like it because it didn't seem to have any additional meaning other than its name. Do you agree? So if you ask me, like, for example, what is organic chemistry? So then, oh, it's a chemistry that deals with organics. What does QSEC do? Oh, it is a quantum center that does science and engineering. So it doesn't really give me any, like, new information other than what is in its name. You know what I'm saying? So quantum mechanics is a mechanics that deals with quantum. No? But then I realized, okay, so this definition came from Richard Feynman, who is one of, I think, uh, the greatest physicists uh, who... Uh, has a lot of works in quantum, but then I realized again, you know, I started liking this definition, okay, because I was a big fan of him uh, when I was reading a lot of uh, books and uh, resources about quantum mechanics when I was an undergrad student. So if I can copy what he did, okay, so then, um, you know, I like to define quantum material in exactly the same way, okay, so a material instead of computer, but then still you just effect of quantum mechanics to its advantage. Okay, hope it makes sense, right? So then um, what I'm looking at is this spin system um, or magnetics. Um, so to me, you know, um, if I say anything wrong, then feel free to correct me, okay? Because again, I'm not a physicist, but uh, spin is just like angular momentum to me, but it is kind of special angular momentum because it is intrinsic. So that means when this particle is born and it comes already with it, no matter what, okay? so. It has nothing to do with any external motion, like whether they are moving or not, whether they are making any orbital motion or not, it is already there, okay? So it is intrinsic and also it is quantum, okay? So it is quantum mechanical property. So uh, it is intrinsic quantum angular momentum, which is what exactly spin means, okay? So then uh, based on our definition, so it has something to do with quantum. So let's see here. So the spin is basically quantized, okay? And spin cannot be directly measured. And spin can do some quantum thing like tunneling. So it can tunnel through a barrier. Okay. So it sounds like it is good quantum mechanical concept that we can deal with. And um, the material system that has spin in there that can be used for any practical application. Uh, there are many examples, but I'm just naming a few here. So for example, we have conventional ferromagnet, uh, like iron, cobalt, nickel, you can think of. Uh, they are like ferromagnetic material that has a lot of unmatched spin or angular momentum uh, inside. And uh, in 2017, I think there was a lot of um, like a big discovery of 2D magnets. Uh, and you know what, when it comes to 2D materials, we had a lot of good, um, like I see here, you know, what kind of materials of 2D material we had so far. So we have 2D conductor, what's that? 2D material, which is conducting, that is graphene, okay? If we have 2D semiconductor, which is transition metal dichloride, okay? So you've probably heard about MOS2 or many other, um, you know, transition metal dichloride material, which are basically semiconductor. And what about 2D insulator? Do we have that? So you probably heard about, yeah, so HBN, okay? So boron nitride. So we already had metal semiconductor insulator, which is 2D, but we didn't really have for long that is 2D magnet. Okay. So uh, in 2017, you know, we got this material discovered, which is intrinsically magnetic, but it's 2D layered materials. Okay. So these are just again the material system examples that have spin inside. But then as an electronics person, 
you know, I would like to see, okay, so how we can bring this spin or the material property uh, and then turn it into your real device application. Okay, so again, uh, here it, uh, we are talking about electronic device, for example. And then uh, you know that electron is a tiny but very strong magnet, uh, like the stone gold -like experiment proved like a long, long time ago. So if you have a um, beam of atoms that go through your magnetic field, then you see that depending on uh, the spin direction, you know, we can have these two different spots which are uh, discretized rather than continuous, okay? So the point is, um, we can do some cool work, okay? Um, to develop some cool computing hardware. Um, and any company hardware, in my opinion, had three major components, okay? So if you open up your computer electronics, anything, then it will consist of memory, like a RAM, right? SRAM, DRAM, uh, even like a flash, okay? And you have logic, which is CPU, GPU, and all that. And everything else is just interconnect, okay? That connects all these different components. So spin can be used to like, you know, impact all these three areas. And my own expertise had been on memory side. As you see here, that is all the, the publications that I had uh, in spin memory. But today I wanted to talk more about this large side because I think even without me, memory is doing its good job. You know, so the spin memory has been like on market already. And there has been uh, like many, many, many good uh, breakthroughs and you know innovations and development. Uh, that is very very close to commercialization. Okay, so maybe at some point later, uh, in a very near future, in my opinion, you see some spin memory in your uh, port of electronics, for example. Okay, um, so but then if you look at logic, okay, CPU, GPU, and all that, um, and maybe more close to you know uh, this quantum computing or something like that. Okay, so we still need a lot of things to be done. Okay. Um, and today I'm gonna to focus more on my work uh, that is related to this logic side, okay? So uh, I put some small like uh, title here, fabrication of spin tunnel device for emerging spin logic applications, but you know, we'll get to that more, okay? So um, I don't know if you heard about what is called spin logic, okay? So Basically here, we wanted to use spin, not charge, okay? So you wanna use charge as a state variable um, to basically make your large device. And um, because it is non-volatile, spin never goes away, okay? It is faster than using charges because you know, think about this, how transistor works. You know, you have source drain and you have charges that are escaping from the source and then they have to travel all the way to the drain, right, in order to, make two distinguished states, like, okay, so we have less electrons, less electronic charges, and more electronic charges, okay? That takes time, that takes energy. But here, if you are manipulating spin, so they can be done much faster and more energy efficient. And of course, it is nanoscale or even like a subatomic scale. So it can increase integration density. So we have a lot of benefits of using spin instead of charge, okay, for electronic devices. Um, and of course, I mean, we are, like extremely driven by this like energy efficiency thing uh, for sure, which I highlight here, uh, because you know if in theory if we use the spin in a proper way, then you get the switching energy that is even less than the thermal limit, which is kVT. Okay, so uh, of course that is in theory. I mean no one has proven it experimentally because of all the challenges that we actually have. Uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute, but this is basically the promise. And again. If properly implemented, the spin tonic computing could better, you know, satisfy our needs. Okay, so especially we are all driven by AI, uh, big data, um, you know, all these things that, um, you know, feeds a lot of data into your computer electronics, which like a conventional hardware uh, cannot really process well. So, uh, in uh, twenty ten, I think, okay, so there was a seminar paper about all spin logic device, okay? So I don't know if you are following up on this article here, but um, this paper was very interesting. Again, this is a theoretical paper, okay? So there has been no experimental demonstration until even now, but uh, this concept was very, very interesting and has been interesting until now because until that time, all the experimental results that are trying to utilize spin for electronics, for spin uh, logic, they have used the spin only as an internal variable, okay? So what does it mean is, 
let's say we have a logic gate. Okay, so this is still like a conventional logic gate, not quantum logic gate. Okay, so let's say we have a, a NAND gate, right? So we can make it using spin. Like you see, here, there are some uh, the ferromagnets and you know all these connections on top of uh, n type semiconductor. But the problem is, uh, this large gate itself is spin tronic. I mean, no matter what, it is spin tronic. Okay, but this large gate needs to be cascaded or connected with another large gate. Okay. So that means we have to like do some conversion between like a charge and spin, okay? So even if the information is processed inside your device in the form of spin, but when it goes out of your device and then it goes to the next level logic gate, okay? So then there should be some conversion between charge and spin. So even if, I mean, the spin itself is good here, fast enough, energy efficient enough inside this device, but as a whole, it's not a best solution, okay? So, then this like a paper again, all spin. So it says all spin, okay? So here, even inside and outside of your device, everything is spin. So there's no spin to charge or charge to spin conversion needed. And uh, we can do a lot of better job, okay? Than uh, all these other conventional devices, okay? So again, no need to perform uh, a spin charge conversion. Okay, so here, and we have this mechanism called spin torque. Uh, they can switch the direction of your ferromagnet and even the energy dissipation should be less than the thermal limit, like I said in theory, okay? So if it is all good, okay, so then what, what's happening here in this area? So even if this concept was very fascinating, but always there's a problem, right? And uh, this whole community has been like looking for something that is more easily implementable because this all spin logic is very hard to experimentally implement. So there were some other like a similar concepts to it. Okay, so like charge coupled spin logic. I don't mean to um, explain too the uh, specifics over here, and uh, something like probabilistic spin logic, uh, which is basically trying to decrease the energy barrier purposely, um, so that you know it kind of mimics our human brain does. So it becomes very close to what uh, neuromorphic computing does. And actually, the authors say. This is exactly between what neuromorphic computing does and quantum computing does. Um, and more recently, I think uh, there was a group of researchers from Intel, uh, and they also used what is this called a magnetic electric effect uh, to build a spin logic circuit. So even if we don't like go deep here for each technology, my point is, okay, even if uh, this all spin logic device was very fascinating and promising in all sense. But again, because it was very hard to implement, so people were working on something else. Okay, they can maybe do some closure or similar jobs here. Okay. So then what is actually holding back? So what is the problem? So why why has it been so challenging, you know, to implement experimentally uh, the original concept, original concept of all spin logic? So then um, you know, these are the challenges again. So when you like to manipulate, deal with spin in your electronic device, so then we need to inject your spin, isn't it? So you are you have spin in your material, but then you have to put this spin in one material to inside of another material. Okay, so you have to inject your spin, and once you have your injection, then you have to transport it. Okay, so it will go through whatever transport channel like electrons do. And once your spin reach, reaches or lands the end of whatever your device or the system, okay, so it should be detected, okay? So in terms of spin injection, transport detection, so we should do all good in all three, but again, each of them have their own challenges and problems. And that's why uh, it's been pretty challenging um, to, you know, do all this like implementation. And in my opinion, uh, the biggest challenge is still spin injection. Okay, so I did some research um, basically to address some challenges here in spin injection. So if you look at this graph here, okay, so this is a uh, ferromagnet. So where if you put your conventional like a normal current through, so then your current will be spin polarized. Okay, so only electrons who have the same direction of ferromagnetic uh, like magnetization. Uh, as what your ferromagnet does, you know, they can go through. 
Um, so then once you get it here and then you do transport. Okay? So then in that injection process, ideally we want your ferromagnet injects only the majority spin. So majority spin means again, the electron that has a spin direction that is the same as the direction of your ferromagnet, okay? So no other like electrons that have opposite spin direction, you know, can enter ideally, okay? And no loss of spin polarization at interface. So a lot of, you know, nanoscale devices all have this interface and, um, you know, interface issues. And here when spin tunnel through, you know, this interface will be a great, great source for something non-ideal, like they can flip or, um, you know, we may lose some, some information. Let's say, you know, there were like a hundred spins came through, but then maybe 20% of it, 30% of it will be lost, okay, during uh, this injection process due to the interface scattering and all that. So because of this, um, like ideal scenarios that look like a too much like ideal, I mean, um, in reality, uh, this injection efficiency never approaches again 100%, okay? So the ferromagnetic material that we are using, um, you know, even if they should be a perfect spin filter that only allows, again, the majority spin go through, but then in reality, we don't have such a material, okay? And even I think in magnetics, we have these specific types of materials called Hoistler alloys, uh, which in theory has 100% spin polarization in each material set, but even if you use it in real, uh, they don't give you 100%, okay? And interface, again, there's no idea like interface in this world, unfortunately, okay? And even like a spin can backflow. It means if you like it here, okay? So if spin is injected here, then some amount of spin will just go back, okay? unless there is some mechanism that uh, prevents that backflow, okay? So that also contributes a little bit of uh, spin loss. So all of these, again, make your injection efficiency very, very far from the level that we want. Um, so here the research problem is, where is the best tunnel barrier material? Because in order to prevent this backflow, uh, we usually put a thin like a tunnel barrier. So hopefully that is like a transparent when the spin comes in, but then somehow, you know, it prevents your spin, um, you know, from going back, okay? So uh, you can mitigate this problem a little bit. So then what is the best material for that? And also how can one best measure this efficiency? I think one um, important thing that makes what engineers do different from what physicists do is, um, you know, in relation to, you know, finding something physically very interesting, you know, no matter what it used to for. But electrical engineers or engineers always like to find, okay, so what, what, what is the number, what is the number that we need, okay, practically needed uh, for our own application. So if you look for like, okay, so, you know, you are looking at like logic switch that is made of transistors, right? That require like your own of ratio of 10 to the four or even greater than that, okay? So then you need your spin injection efficiency of greater than 90%, okay? Which sounds very, very crazy and which, which sounds to me, it's almost impossible, okay? Or um, due to all these challenges that I listed, okay? But then what about, because we all talk about quantum here uh, and you know, what about we use spin for qubit? Okay, so qubit is not necessarily built upon transistors. Okay, we may not need transistors at all. Okay, uh, but then, you know, maybe we can compromise this number a little bit so that, okay, so maybe some, you know, we can find maybe some uh, number that is maybe more easily implementable. Okay, so we don't need that like a high perfection here. Okay, so 90% uh, or greater than 90%. Okay, so I haven't measured or I don't think anyone measured this number yet. Okay, but I think um, you know if we if you like to use this concept to create to implement some sort of qubit, uh, then you know uh, we don't need that high efficiency here. Okay. So um, graphene, I know a lot of people are working on two D materials and graphene, uh, but here I'm looking at graphene as a uh, perfect material uh, for this barrier, okay? I mean, the tunnel barrier because of all these things. Um, if you don't have any like a good background on here, then that's fine. But, you know, just to pinpoint that 
graphene or many other 2D materials, uh, you know, they have very interesting property that makes you create a um, heterostructure. Like if you have graphene or any other 2D material that is put together in, 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 in I mean, physically, physically together with any other ferromagnet, like a cobalt or nickel, then they can actually create a very, very good interface. Okay, because their uh, lattice mismatch is very low, uh, less than only a few percent. And physically, it is said to be, you know, brilliant zone comparable and some, you know, spin like a filtering, you know, but if you're not familiar, then that's fine. Okay, so I think the good, I mean, the point here is graphene or many other 2D materials can have very nice interface with ferromagnets. Okay. Um, and in this area, a lot of what, what a lot of people do is, um, you know, this TMR, which stands for tunneling magnet resistance. So if you have a ferromagnet and another ferromagnet, and then you have a tunneling barrier between, okay, so then when the current goes through, so when they are parallel versus anti-parallel, so they will give you the different resistance, okay? So that is referred to as TMR. So people measure TMR in order to basically uh, study all this, okay? Because that's the easiest way like to fabricate devices and do some measurement because they've been so good at doing this. But the problem is, okay? So they are very, very sensitive to the details of interface structures. And even if they are greatly affected by interface, the TMR doesn't tell you anything about interface, okay? So if your TMR changes for some reason that you don't know. Why, why, why uh, that happens, okay? So I was looking for, okay, so some other ways to characterize all this. And um, one method that I find very interesting is what is called a superconducting tunneling spectroscopy. So if you are not familiar, then this is basically a technique of you have, um, like for example, you have a ferromagnet insulator and superconductor here. So they have this uh, interesting, um, structures, FIS, and then if you apply a very high magnetic field here, and then there is a physical phenomena called uh, Zima splitting, okay? So this Zima splitting is very interesting because uh, that is a direct indicator of what happens in the energy band diagram, the energy band of your ferromagnet. For example, if you electrically measure this, Bi over dB, which is basically the resistance and very small bias voltage, and then see here, if this GMA splitting happens, so then this IB curve that you see is exactly uh, like a, showing you how what, what the energy band structure looks like for your ferromagnet. So the point is, uh, this technique is good in terms of getting you, I mean, giving you the best graph or the image of how the energy band structure looks like for ferromagnet. Uh, there is a key information that we need in order to know all about the spin uh, and you know how spin tunnels and all that. Okay, but there are. I mean, this technique is very not easy, and not every lab, not every university has it, in my opinion, because it needs very, very, very high magnetic field, and it needs very, 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 very low temperature. So see here. So this experiment should be done like a ten millikelvin at fourteen tesla. Okay. And I don't know if George Mason even has this, and I was lucky to find my collaborator, um, you know, who, who can do this experiment for me. Uh, but again, um, you know, since I uh, joined here, George Mason, I was still looking for, um, you know, uh, some faculty or researcher here at Mason or some other institution nearby. But because this experiment is possibly required, and plus, not everyone knows how to make this device. I mean, when we make this FIS device, again, okay, ferromagnet, insulator, and superconductor, okay? So that device is infamously fragile, okay? Because you have very thin layer of tunnel barrier. So even if you do something, like a very, apply very small voltage, but it may break your, um, your tunnel barrier or something like that. So it's very hard to make a reliable uh, and reproducible uh, device like this. Um, and I can proudly say, I mean, my group is one of very few, I believe, you know, who can actually make this kind of device so that you can study, um, you know, what happens in terms of spin injection uh, through 2D materials, because we are so much interested in 2D materials. For example, if I here, the tunnel barrier is graphene or any other 2D materials, okay, so then would it help or would it not help? Or if it helps, then how much? 
you know, those things can be studied uh, using this device platform. Again, it is not easy to fabricate and it involves a lot of um, uh, non-fabrication process. But uh, this is just a few snapshots of uh, the devices that I've made. And uh, you see here, this is uh, just top view of the cross pointing structure. So we are using, I was using aluminum uh, as your superconducting material. Um, and it has graphene in between. And your top electrode is nickel ion, uh, which is a paramagnet. So you have paramagnet insulator superconductor structure here. And in 3D, it looks more like this. Um, and the thicknesses and uh, all that are given here. And this is the uh, process flow that has 16 multiple steps, okay? Um, I'm sure if you are a graduate student who is working on this, maybe it will take maybe a few years to complete this. But um, here I'm showing you the graphene, for example, you know, we can actually pair it nicely and transfer your graphene uh, so that you have uh, some regions that you have graphene and you have some other regions that do not have graphene so that you can see here, no peaks. No Raman peaks here, but you have uh, graphene peaks here. So you can see your graphene, you have placed the graphene in the area that you want, uh, where this like a tunneling process happens. And this is uh, some pictures. This is, these are some pictures uh, of these devices. And uh, this is like, I don't know if you can see these wires here. So this is nicely wire bonded uh, to a special holder again that goes to this very high magnetic field and low temperature measurement facility. Uh, and this is a uh, TM image of the sample that we created. So here, uh, this is your silicon, silicon oxide substrate, aluminum, uh, which is a superconductor. And uh, because aluminum is very easy to oxidize in air anyway, so you're gonna have a little bit of aluminum oxide, uh, native oxide anyway. And then on top, we transport graphene, and there is a homoloid or nickel ion, a paramagnet here. So uh, we, made this device again and then um you know this is just like pre-testing to see uh, if devices if these devices were made well or not so we were able to test uh, its IV curve and uh, we can actually do very nice like a characterization here uh, they can actually let you estimate the tunneling barrier thickness by just doing this fitting um, to a famous model called Siemens model so if something happens, if your conduction happens by tunneling, then you know it should fit that graph. Okay, and then you can extract that number here. That is exactly the same as what we see in your T image. Okay, so I think uh, I mean we got to this conclusion here that okay, so we made the device pretty well and it's ready to do this like a high mag, high magnetic field and low temperature measurements so that uh, we can see again. Uh, how graphene and or other 2D materials, if they are put it here, uh, how can, I mean, what, what, what's their role, uh, you know, when they meet with the spin injection, okay? So that if that is happened to be good, then can bring this idea to um, you know, implement this uh, spin logic concept that I introduced earlier, okay? I think, yeah, I think I talked a little bit too fast here, but I think it's good to uh, leave some time for your questions if you have. Okay? So I think, um, you know, the key points are, I think, all summarized here nicely. Okay? So I think um, the spin logic, again, uh, we are, I mean, there are a lot of researchers who are looking at spin uh, in order to make logic device, uh, and then they may even like find useful information, I mean, the applications in uh, quantum computing, because again, it is, only one of few who can give you the energy efficiency, again, that is less than the thermal limit, okay? Uh, I think that it is very useful in quantum. And uh, among a lot of other like a material candidate platforms, I think uh, there were a lot of introductions earlier today when Patrick was talking about this IBM, like a uh, quantum computer, which is made, made of uh, superconducting circuits. And he was also mentioning some groups, um, the company, uh, you know, they are making some, um, like a trap ion technology uh, to do this quantum computing. But um, you know, one, one other thing that has been also very common in this area is they are using electron, electron spin in semiconductor QD, I mean, the quantum dots, okay? I think the only reason is because, it's not because they are superior to other emerging candidates, but in my opinion, the reason that people have been using electron spin in semiconductor quantum dots 
is because it's advantage in manufacturing. Okay? Because people already know how to make the semiconductor quantum dots because they're comparable with uh, you know, what they've been doing for CMOS technology. Okay? So I think in terms of um, the coherence times, in terms of scalability, I'm sure you can find some other better technology for sure. But in terms of manufacturing, uh, this has been still the pop most popular uh, technology. So if you look at, for example, uh, one of the paper that was published uh, just like a, two years ago in Nature, uh, then there was a quantum logic uh, implemented using uh, spin qubits. Okay, so that's exactly uh, the motivation that drove all this work. Okay, so feel free to uh, take a look. Being quantum electronics as 2D materials through potential. I don't know if you believe, I don't know if you agree, but I think, do you think 2D materials can beat silicon? For CMOS, for example? I don't think so. Okay. So I think silicon CMOS is doing just two good jobs. So no other, any other technology can beat silicon in my opinion, okay? But maybe uh, 2D materials can find some other applications that silicon may not do well. So I think one, application that people found is flexible electronics because like silicon is fundamentally like, like a rigid. Okay. okay. But, but 2D materials are no. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Looks good. Looks, looks good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, flexible electronics is one key area that people use 2D materials for a lot, but to, I mean, uh, there, there must be some other materials also they can do well in flexible electronics. So I don't think flexible electronics is the only application that 2D materials can do well, okay? So in my opinion, spin okay, or even quantum okay, is maybe okay, the, the real, real true potential area uh, that 2D materials can do uh, very well, uh, and not other materials can do uh, as much as 2D materials, in my opinion. Okay? So I think there, you see a lot of uh, great research and works are going on here in this area. So in this specific uh, talk here today, I show you, for example, we can make a ferromagnetic tunnel device uh, that uh, can serve as a unique, unique platform uh, to basically study and quantify uh, spin-dependent transport in your nanomaterials. So if you have any nanomaterials of your interest, graphene, TMD, uh, HBN, or some sort of other new materials, and you want to see how spin goes through it, and when spin goes through it, what happens in terms of the flip or not, or you know, how, how many uh, spins are preserved and not preserved, you know. So then I think this device can serve as a good platform to study. Okay. And this can be a good bridge for sure uh, between materials and uh, system level applications, because again, that is taking any good materials here. And if it is good, then we can take it to uh, the next level of system is implementation, for example, for uh, computing hardware. And I show you here uh, graphene. I took graphene as an example here, uh, as a case study and um, to use it as a tunnel barrier for efficient spin injection. So uh, this STS measurement is being done right now, again, through my collaborator, but hopefully uh, if I find some good collaborator here in George Mason or in town, I think um, there'll be you know some more exciting results uh, coming pretty soon um, to tell you if um, you know, graphene or any other 2D materials can do any good job in spin injection experience. I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. I think I finished too early. <laughs> it's better than the other one. Any questions? Not very good, but just wondering, can you have for students in your lab? Oh yeah, so absolutely. Uh, yeah, because I'm still um, new here. I mean, I've been here just one and a half semester uh, and I'm looking for um, students who like to work with. I mean, not necessarily on this project, but something similar to like this that is placed at the boundary of physics and electrical engineering, most likely, and working on nanoscale uh, materials and devices um, and looking at magnetics, uh, then uh, yes, there is opportunity and feel free to contact me if you are interested. You, you mentioned wire bonding devices. 
uh, who makes this wire bond. So wire bonding was done by myself, I mean, my, my group, uh, but then this specific, uh, special holder uh, that goes to STS uh, has been manufactured by my collaborator. What is the key functional material that's used in Other than the graphene. Oh, so here, um, the important piece of material here is the, the, the selection of superconducting materials. Yeah, because here I have chosen aluminum. Yeah, because again, that is relatively easy to deposit. And also it gives us very like uh, reliable TC. I mean, the temperature that below which you go to superconducting state. Uh, but then if that requires like very, very too small, like a temperature, then I think it's gonna make us like very hard to do this experiment. Uh, and also it is related to like a how sharp, like the splitting happens. So depending on, on like, I think uh, we may have some other superconducting materials other than aluminum, right? So they may have higher TC, but then, you know, the problem is whether they can have this like a clear, like a signature of uh, G mass splitting. So I think, um, other than 2D material itself, uh, it's all, uh, the superconducting material has been, I mean, should should be chosen like very carefully uh, in order to you know do this experiment. But I think, um, yeah, in this study, I I have chosen aluminum for uh, for this purpose. As a follow-up question, I just wonder when you consider other like superconducting like, 2D and other materials rather than aluminum. Ah, uh, that might be very interesting. Yeah, but I haven't tried. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. So if, if we can have 2D materials which can be superconducting uh, with reasonable TC, uh, and then maybe they'll maybe even better interfaces because both are 2D materials, and I think that would be really great to study. But I haven't done done it. Yet. Good. Question. Um, <laughs> the higher the better. I mean, for sure. Uh, but um, and also as long as you have this experimental facility. Uh, they can give you like less than one Kelvin, uh, then it should be okay. So, I mean, there's no like magic number that, you know, serves the best here, but I'd say just the higher the better, but if it is not high enough, then I think I can still do the experiments by like lowering your temperature to, to very, very low. So it should be, yeah, it should be feasible. Do you have the Yep, yeah, that's good question. So I think I skipped maybe too fast here. Uh, sorry about that, but you're right. So if you have your material own, I mean, if you have a material of your own interest, then you should be able to somehow find how you can transfer that material into this device, right? So in this case, graphene was separately grown by CBD on another like a copper foil and then it was actually wet transferred uh, to this device. So uh, you could like completed the bottom electrode, which is superconductor first, and then you transfer your graphene on top, and then you deposited ferromagnet on top of your graphene. So I think um, depending on the 2D material that you like to put in, uh, we should figure out how to um, you know transfer because usually it's very hard to grow 2D materials directly on top of your own substrate because of the thermal budget. So for example, graphene, do you know how much temperature do you need for your CBD growth? So if you like to grow your graphene by CBD,